Hey guys, it's Kevin with Mixed Coach. Today I'm talking to Slough, is it Halatin? Halatin. Halatin. Mm -hmm. Some of you might know him uh, by just Slough. Uh, that's how I know him. That's the first time I've ever pronounced his name, obviously. <laughs> um, and, I, and I have to admit, I'm just now getting up to speed with, uh, with what you're doing, Slough, but I wanted to, uh, I heard your podcast, Sessions with Slough, and mm -hmm. I was so uh, impressed with the one or two podcasts that I heard, I loved your insight, I loved your wit, and uh, it, immediately I felt uh, this uh, kind of kinship, so I thought <laughs> I would give you a call and uh, cool. maybe try to get to know you a little bit better. And we've talked, Sounds good. We've talked one other time on the phone and mm -hmm. one other time via email, so everybody, right. uh, welcome Slough to the uh, interview, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks much, for, Kevin. Such, such an honor to be Slough. here. Well, uh, Slough, tell me... Uh, how long have you been doing that the podcast? I, I feel like I'm missing out because I've only heard one or two episodes. Oh, well, the podcast, you know, I, I got involved in the podcasting world way back, uh, kind of toward, toward the beginning, around 2005, mm -hmm. and uh, involved in the sense that I got involved in the community of podcasting. And uh, I got involved sort of musically as a person who did sort of some jingles for some podcasts. Namely, the big one was um, Adam Curry's uh, podcast, uh, what would that? What the hell was his podcast called? <laughs> Adam Curry's. Uh, I forgot. I, I even forgot. It was, was it like. The um, one? Oh, I, I can't believe. It. Oh my god. He had you know Pod Show. He had a whole big network right. of podcasts. I'll put a link to it. And um, well, long long story short, maybe perhaps too late now. Long story short, <laughs> uh, was uh, I I really got heavily involved. It's D Daily Source Code, by the way. That was his podcast. Um, I sent a song in. Um, because they were into this whole pod safe music thing, mm -hmm. you know, because, because of licensing, you couldn't play commercial music, you know, anything that wasn't licensed for podcasting. And uh, it was coming up on the Christmas season and Adam Curry said, geez, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have any pod safe Christmas songs. And I thought, mm, you know, I co-wrote a song a while before that and I posted it onto the network and Adam listened to it and he loved it. He said, wow, this would be so great if we did sort of a we are the world kind of version of this. And so I ended up recording and producing this song called If Every Day Were Christmas uh, with people from nine different countries, probably 50 some odd musicians, singers and stuff like that. And that was my foray into the podcasting world. Um, I started contributing to something called the Project Studio Network. So, of course, when, when these podcasts started coming about, I started, you know, looking around for things that were audio related, of course. Um, being an audio engineer, that's what I was like, you know, hunting around for, you know. Um, and I came across P Project Studio Network. I uh, got to know Big Al and Mike Bolin, the, the hosts of that show. Um, and I started doing segments for them. Uh, and at a certain point, uh, you know, I, they started to sort of fade and, and weren't putting out as many episodes at that point. And I started, I, I thought to myself, let me spin this off and do a podcast of my own. And I really enjoy podcasting. The thing is, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very time intensive depending on what kind of format you want to do. Because sometimes if you're doing like, roundtable format or maybe two hosts or something like that it's far easier to just sit down record something a discussion have a list of topics eh, you edit out one or two things and boom you're done mm -hmm. my approach was a little bit different uh since number one i was doing it myself uh, but secondly i was I'm a fan of the sort of, I don't know, I, I don't want to, I don't mean to say that I'm on this level necessarily, but the, but the kind of NPR, Radio Lab kind of production where you have dialogue or, or narration interspersed with uh, samples, ambience, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so to put out an episode like I, the, the way I like to do, uh, like, for example, there, there was an episode about If Every Day Were Christmas, the, the way I put that together and all that kind of stuff with excerpts and, you know, outta not out eh, outtakes and stuff from the multi-track sessions. And I go through and say, oh, this was the keyboard. This was the kick. This was the hot. These, the, you know, these were the overheads, et cetera. I used this and this and this on that. You know, to 
together an episode like that that lasts maybe an hour or some, something. Mm-hmm. Boy, that took me... I, 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 I hate to think what it took me. <laughs> I mean, days, probably. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was days that I had time. I didn't have sessions on those days. And, you know, and I did what I felt like doing. But it's not a money-making venture for me. I, you know, yeah. some people choose to monetize their podcasts, and that's great. I, I choose not to. It's not my business. Right. Um, but I enjoy it quite a bit, you know. And uh, there was a sort of a long period of time that I didn't put out any episodes. I was just crazy busy. I just didn't have the time to do it. And uh, But I got back into it. Recently, I put put out three episodes like within the span of three weeks which is unheard of for me <laughs> but uh but yeah i'm, I'm getting back into yeah. it uh you know whenever i can yeah well i, I love the quality i was going to ask you a quick question about your podcast is it something to where you do you play the samples of, as you go or do you cut those in later or is there like i cut those in later yeah, yeah. i mean there. I suppose I could get it to a point where, you know, I mean, you could trigger samples and stuff like that. But, you know, with me, one never knows how long-winded I will become. It's not a, measure, it's not a matter of whether I'll be long-winded. It's how <laughs> long-winded. And so when I start talking about something, you know, if I talk about, let's say, uh, you know, a, 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 a woodwind section mm-hmm. in, a, in a recording that I did, you know, I might, I might say two sentences about it or I might say oh you know what I used this time I used <laughs> such and such a, a, a mic or a preamp on this p- particular instrument and one never knows how long I'm going to go so I always cut that stuff in afterwards yeah, yeah. well uh, one, another thing that uh, I found that you do that I do as well is record European or- orchestras or yes. Eastern European orchestras yes. I've recorded over in Prague several times and that oh, was a what? I got mm-hmm. in way over my head, but uh, landed <laughs> on my feet. Uh, yeah. But I was going to talk to you about, you've been to Kiev, Ukraine, yes. several times recording the orchestra there. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, and that that, that really is one of my favorite gigs. Uh, back in the 90s, I was living in London uh, at the time for a couple of years, and uh, I got a call from a producer in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and sort of a mutual friend uh, who worked at a radio station there recommended me for this particular gig. They were recording an orchestra for this dance ensemble uh, called Shumka. It's a Ukrainian dance ensemble in Edmonton. And they, uh, this, this past year, they celebrated their 50th anniversary. They've been around for a long time. It's a huge company, and they have a school and everything like that. Anyway, they, uh, they used to tour with orchestra. And they used to do their recordings in in Edmonton. Uh, I don't know if they used the Edmonton Symphony or something like that. But anyway, um, it got prohibitively expensive for them to tour in such a manner. Um, And they decided that they were going to try touring with a digital recording of an orchestra. And what they did, what they decided to do is they decided to go to Ukraine to record an orchestra there. And I Pretty. Sh- I'm not sure if their first four uh, forays into this was like a particular Nutcracker version that they were doing. Anyway, uh, what happened was the the recording engineer there uh, recorded the orchestra, you know, like as as normally you would. Let's say a two track recording, just a stereo recording, uh, and put it onto CD format, and. What happened was they, they, they went on a tour with this, and they just weren't happy with it. They were saying it was just the, the, the orchestra didn't sound good. The recording just didn't sound good. It was Things were very muddy. They, they weren't defined. It was kind of a wash. Mm-hmm. And then when they sent me the recording, I realized instantly what it was. They were, first of all, they were playing back a recording that was already at a limited dynamic range, at 96 decibels at best. And it was a recording that was filled with reverb. It was absolutely swimming in reverb, Mm -hmm. which is fine just for listening in your car or in your living room or whatever. But when you're you're bringing this into a 10,000-seat arena, uh, you've got reverb of reverb suddenly. Mm -hmm. And so I said to them, well, first of all, you need to be recording 24-bit. Secondly, you've got this has to be as dry as possible. 
you know, so that the venues in which you're playing this stuff back are actually delivering the ambience that you're expecting to hear in a room that size. Right. And, uh, well, here's the clincher. Um, the thing was, they were going to continue doing these recordings in Ukraine, and, you know, they were going to have to use the house engineer. You know, he was going to have to be a part of it, you know, because the staff there, you know, they, they don't speak English at all. And what they needed was an engineer to oversee this, to ba basically be a chief sound engineer for the project. Mm -hmm. Um, and they needed somebody who could speak Ukrainian. And I am ethnically Ukrainian. I was born in the United States, in New York City. But my parents were both from Ukraine, so I learned Ukrainian when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I still speak it fairly fluently. Mm -hmm. So I went over there for the first time in 1994, and I've just been on every gig since. And... Um, I love it. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, you know, to be involved in a project where you have you know, 60 or 70 musicians, you know, a large staff, uh, maintenance, anything you need. You know, N now we're recording in this place called, uh, um, it's abbreviated DZZ for uh, Diem Zvoko Zapis. It's like the house of sound recording, I guess mm -hmm. is how you, how you translate it. Mm -hmm. it's, gigantic. it's like, it's like, larger than Abbey Road, you know, it's on that level. It's a purpose-built orchestral recording studio. They have four, two huge rooms and then two smaller rooms for smaller ensembles. Right. And it's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I love it. I really, really love it. That's one and the, thing. First time, the first time I did it, by the way, I, I was flying by the seat of my pants. <laughs> I had never recorded anything that big. I had done large ensembles, but... Not an orchestra. Right, not right. An orchestra. I, 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 of course, you know, said, yeah, sure, I can handle it. <laughs> yeah, I've got friends who can tell me what to do. That's, I mean, I don't think you can really get ahead as, you know, being a producer engineer unless you're willing to uh, risk the egg on your face, you know, uh, of, of failing big. But mm -hmm. uh, I think mm -hmm. you rarely ever do fail completely, but uh, no, you yeah, it's, always it's, learn from it, you know. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And as long as you follow basic principles, I mean, it's, you know, you, you just sort of translate a little bit. You might have to adapt a little bit. Um, I was out in, in uh, San Francisco at the AES show, uh, and I was, uh, I was uh, out at dinner with uh, Frank Filippetti, who's recorded a ton of large projects. Uh, like, you know, the cast albums of like Wicked and Book of Mormon and stuff like that. He, he's huge in, in that sort of uh, particular industry, aside from like other gigantic projects, of course. But I, I asked him, I said, you know, so you've done orchestras and stuff. I said, you know, did, how did you get into that? I mean, because I knew he did some, you know, pop projects and worked with, you know, people like James Taylor or stuff like that. But I said, but you know, what was it that got you into orchestral recordings? He says, I didn't have any training. I just, you know, you start out recording string sections, you start out recording, you know, a brass section, and then you just start building upon your previous knowledge. And that's exactly how I got into it. You know, yeah. recording smaller ensembles, bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you just translate and you just apply what you know from smaller projects into bigger projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, one little thing before we leave this subject, this, the thing about European orchestras that uh, it seems like we're lacking, well, at least in Nashville anyway, there's not a room like the one I recorded in in Prague. I mean, the one I recorded in when, in Prague was, you know, gymnasium-sized recording studio that was treated. Yes. And Absolutely. then basically you could put, you know, you could pull the deca tree up, which is, you know, the three microphones right over the conductor. That's right. And the outriggers. And yes. then you pretty much had your sound. Uh, That's right. Whereas That's here, right. you know, you pretty much have to mix things in because people want things in booths or there's not a room big enough that would sound yep. good if things leaked into other microphones. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, yeah, yeah. okay, moving off of the... Uh, orchestral recording uh i noticed that uh, i saw a picture of you on the internet with the uh, i think it met alliance and i have to admit yes. i don't know what that is exactly so why don't you explain to me what that is oh well the met alliance is um it's basically a a group of engineers uh including al schmidt George Massenberg, frank Filippetti, ed cherney elliot shiner chuck ainley and who am I forgetting? 
Uh, oh, Phil Ramone, of course. Um, and they're basically, they're, I think their goal, I, they have a website, metalliance.com, I believe is, is, the, is the website. I think their, their main objective is education. I think they, they try to mentor uh, engineers. Uh, they try to promote excellence in audio, really. Um, they've done a couple of these things called, uh, I think they're called in-session events. They did the first one out in Capitol, uh, at Capitol in Los Angeles. And they did another one at Avatar Studios a few years ago. And what it is is basically a weekend, a whole weekend of sessions with these guys. Hmm. And you have full access to them. You're part of the sessions. You're not officially assisting. That's, you know, you're, you're, not, a, mm. you're not a hired person, basically. It's essentially a, a, a weekend-long master class mm -hmm. with them. And um, I did that a couple of years ago. And it was, it was at, uh, I mentioned at Avatar Studios, which is right here in New York. It's very convenient and stuff like that. Uh, I went to it. Uh, it's probably one of the best things I've ever done. Just really... Uh, you know, so it, it, it's such um, a learning, an incredible learning experience to be able to observe these guys while they're working, ask any question at any given point, you know, um, sort of doing a, a, you know, reading interviews with these guys. You know, you you have certain sort of standard kinds of questions and standard kind of kinds of responses like, well, it depends. <laughs> You know, like the most popular answer. <laughs> but in, in this case, when you ask a question, it's very specific to that thing. It's it's not a. It depends because this these are the circumstances we're talking about. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do now under these circumstances in this room with that drummer singing while he's playing drums? <laughs> How are you going to capture him? Yeah. You know, ah. Okay. Well, I'm going to use a a a Bayer M160. Oh, really? I would have never. Yeah. Well, that's what Phil Collins used when I recorded him. But oh, uh, you know, you get a whole different kind of a whole different level of question and answer. Right. Uh, so, man, I, I I would I would do it again in a heartbeat. You know, I think there's another one going on um, in L.A. I think sometime this year. Uh, boy, fantastic event! I yeah. have to check into that. Well, yeah. you know, when we first got uh, acquainted a couple of weeks ago, Slough. Uh, in an email back, you said, because uh, I had mentioned that uh, I was possibly going to meet Al Schmidt here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. and you said, tell mm -hmm. Al that, uh, you know, remind him that you were at, uh, I guess the Met Alliance is where you yeah. met. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, where I first him, met, yeah. Tell him I'm probably the only blind recording engineer he knows. Yeah, tell and, him I said hi. Yeah. yeah, if he didn't remember the name, he <laughs> yeah. would know the guy with the white cane. <laughs> <laughs> well, that fascinated me because... Uh, I have a member on my website, a mm -hmm. mixed coach member, that um, he is blind and he's asked me questions uh -huh. on how does uh, someone in my, you know, situation get work as a recording engineer? And and I and I have to say I have in the back of my mind I've been searching for someone who is who who's already kind of blazed the path for him. And I was just going to ask you some questions. Uh, what are some of the, some of the challenges that you've encountered? Uh, being a blind recording engineer. Right. Well, when I first started out uh, in, in the Middle Ages, we used to use tape, you know, and yeah. an analog console. It was, it was a different world. Um, there were still challenges, but I think the big challenge these days is the fact that every – well, it, it, it's a challenge and yet it's an advantage – the challenge is that everything is really moving into the DAW world, and a lot of software isn't accessible. And that's a big problem. Now, there was a time when, uh, let's say, Pro Tools was really accessible uh, on the Mac using a screen reader called Outspoken. And... Uh, that's how I got into Pro Tools. I, as, at a certain point, had to switch over from an analog to a digital studio. I mean, uh, it was getting to the point where the equipment was breaking down and I was spending more money having a tech 
fix the stuff. And just, you know, at that point, Pro Tools HD came out. It was just the right uh, set of circumstances for me to jump over to the digital uh, side of things. And um, the thing was it, was, it was really accessible, but there was a certain point where stuff changed from uh, OS 9 to OS 10. And then eventually when digital design at the time went over to OS 10 and made their first version of Pro Tools in OS 10, there was no screen reader. There was no sc- new screen reader for OS 10. Oh boy, this was a problem. You know, eventually Apple built a screen reader right into OS 10, which was fantastic. I mean, you get, a, I mean, sc- uh, on the Windows side of things, people spent twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars, you know, for a screen reader. Mm-hmm. Whereas Apple decided to build it right in, which was fantastic. Problem was, when I went to launch Pro Tools, it was not accessible. All it saw was the menus, and then that's it. It was just, uh, it said scroll area, scroll area, scroll area, scroll area, but nothing within that. And, uh, well, that, that started a, a basically a six year journey for me with mm-hmm. digit design slash avid because during that time they changed over to avid. And, um, I flew out there a couple of times, kept in touch with, uh, folks at avid, uh, at the trade shows, at the various trade shows, kept a dialogue, a discussion going. And uh, eventually, a couple of years ago, Pro Tools became accessible. They did the work necessary from their end to identify the various controls, uh, things, I mean, simple things, buttons, checkboxes, lists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the thing was, that was good, but they didn't go the full nine yards. Uh, so there was still work to be done, but it was very slow going. As you know, Avid has undergone enormous layoffs and stuff like that. Uh, so it was hard to get the work to continue. But most recently, this past AES, when I was out there, um, since I was going to be out there, I went out there for a meeting with them, and we decided to take a slightly different approach. And that was the fact that in Pro Tools 10, uh, they, there was a real big push for international language support. And the head of, basically the guy that's in charge of Pro Tools right now, uh, Rich Holmes, said, you know, the way I look at it, accessing Pro Tools with voiceover, with the screen reader, is not really much different than accessing Pro Tools in a different language. It's just an alternate means. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should go to Gary Greenfield, the CEO, and get his blessing on this because then it could become a part of our in-house testing and just our natural UI design process. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's worth a try. I mean, if he said no, I think it probably would have been dead in the water. I don't don't think they could have continued. Mm -hmm. But I wrote a letter to to Gary Greenfield and so did Rich, I guess, and uh, we got a response saying, Go ahead, do it. Sounds like a good plan. You're doing the right thing, and mm-hmm. so that that was a, a, a an enormous, uh, uh, you know, uh, victory for us, really, <laughs> in the sense of accessibility. Um, so anyway, um, and you know, that's I think that one of the biggest challenges is the fact that we face technologies that are inaccessible out of the box, and sometimes you have to create workarounds there was a time when let's say if you were using some type of a a, a digital recorder or a, any kind of recorder really a blind user wouldn't necessarily know what the levels were but I mean, when i started out i had enough you know let's say low vision that i could i could like go right up against a vu meter and get a sense if that if that needle was hovering around zero i'd i'd kind of see it there you know uh i could see the peak led going off Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. but you know for for a lot of people who are maybe totally blind they don't have that option you know Mm -hmm. that luxury these days i don't i've lost more vision over the years and at this point that would not be feasible for me um at one point for example i um I had a guy uh, build a little a little box for me, but basically the size of a deck of cards, essentially, and it had input and an output, basically an inline level meter, so that when 
when the level reached a certain, uh, well, when the signal reached a certain level in terms of volts, uh, the thing would vibrate just like a beeper. Yeah, I mean, you know, like the vibration on a phone, you know, right. on a mobile phone right. and stuff. And it was a great way if I was doing a live, uh, you know, say I, I sometimes did remote sessions where I was recording ensembles or choirs or whatever in cathedrals or something like that. Uh, I didn't do that work that much, but when I did, boy, that was a lifesaver because I was, as I was taking levels, I could, you know, I could get a sense for what that, if I was reaching basically an area that was dangerous, I'd, I'd hit, feel that thing vibrate and I was right. like, uh-oh, let me back off those levels. Right. And uh, yeah, yeah, so there are, there are things that one can do to adapt, uh, oh, you know, cable numbering, my goodness, yeah. I, you know, I can't tell you how many hundreds and hundreds, thousands, what am I talking about, <laughs> connections I have through these patch bays and, and stuff like that, um, I went ahead and brailed them with little tags, you know, with uh, uh, aluminum tags and like little braille indications of, you know, channels 1 through 8, 9 through 16, whatever. Right. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of things that, that one can do in, in terms of uh, adapting um, it to, to work in an environment where, where, where you're dealing with technology. I have essentially a whole slew of documents on my laptop that, uh, identify the layouts of pieces of equipment, you know, so that when I jump behind the DBX 160, oh, wait a second, what uh, is this the input or is that the output? You, right, know? Right. Or, you know, all right, with, with XLRs, that, that's easy, but sometimes you get a TRS jack and you, you don't know what's what, or, right. you know, or is this labeled from left to right, one through eight, or is it eight through one? Different manufacturers. Yeah. Use different, uh, you know, standards. Wow, and stuff. It, it's uh, it's overwhelming to think mm -hmm. about how much, how many things that I take for granted of being able to just, to just read and look. You know, this yes. green cable is going here, and I you you can see the path. Yes. But, yes. Uh, so my hats off to you, man. To, to do <laughs> the kind of work and the quality of work that you do, um, mm -hmm. uh, with with that uh, mm -hmm. as, as an obstacle that you've overcome is a uh, is very uh, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it it does it does force me to be extra careful and really dot my eyes and cross my t's. Mm -hmm. And so, for me, it's it just works out to be an advantage in another sense. Uh, when I was in school for uh, audio engineering, uh, you know, I recorded my classes. I couldn't sit there and take notes quickly enough. And I recorded my classes, and then I listened back to them and took notes at my leisure. And that was because I was blind. Mm -hmm. The thing is, having listened to those lectures twice and taking notes while I'm doing it, uh, that ended up working so much to my advantage. I, I, I aced my way through school. I absolutely, I got A's in every single subject except for one B+. Plus. Which was in sight singing of all things, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> so I got like a three point nine nine average. It drove me nuts. But what could you do? You know, who cares? <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you know, you have to. Uh, uh, you know, you you have to do what you have to do, and if it's important, you know, you figure out ways. You know, to make uh, certain adaptations or certain alternate means of of doing things, and you know, for 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 like blind, uh, you know, audio uh, professionals or blind audio hobbyists or whatever, I always recommend that they go to uh, ptaccess.com dot com for anything related to uh, accessing Pro Tools as a blind user, right. and uh, you know, there there are big communities, you know, here and there of people who sort of are more focused on sort of general audio or very specifically Pro Tools or Sonar. You know, there are pockets of people and a lot of people are, of course, in, have, you know, a foot in this camp and a foot in that camp too and stuff like that. But So uh, now is, uh, is Pro Tools the most accessible uh, doll that you're aware of? It's, uh, well, not yet in the sense that this whole thing about making the issue of accessibility testing in-house and everything like, like that, that's only now beginning. 
It is quite accessible, but not fully. Like, none of the MIDI stuff is really accessible. You could, you know, create a MIDI track, uh, assign, you know, inputs and outputs to it, record, enable it, record something, cut, copy, and paste, scrub in it, and stuff like that. But, like, for example, in the event list, you, you can't read down that list and say, ah, here's that C4 that, you know, was, you know, not supposed to be there. It, it's, that's not accessible yet. So, uh, we're, we're, you know, in the next, uh, probably, I, I would say probably in the next uh, release, we're going to see uh, a huge improvement because the beta cycle is about to start and, and I'm on that beta team. So Okay, cool. <laughs> well, what's something that, uh, uh, I, I know we need to wrap this up. I've, I've kept you for too long. You look like you're busy sitting, <laughs> no, my pleasure. sitting in your studio. <laughs> uh, it, by, oh, by the way, side note, this is your studio. Uh, is it a home studio? or? Yep. Uh, no, uh, I we actually have uh, an apartment in the. We own the building, mm -hmm. so we it's a it's a an apartment building, and so we have a place on the top floor, and this is on the ground floor in the back of the building. People always say like, "Wow, you know, in New York, geez, you know, it must be hard to soundproof and stuff like that." Yes, it is, <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the advantages that we have being toward the back of the building is that we have a pretty busy street in the, toward the front of the building. Mm -hmm. But that's you know that doesn't affect us back here. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I used to work out of home, uh, you know, d d dedicated a bedroom, you know, at a certain point when way back when when I first started off, you know. Doing the the whole Porta Studio route and stuff like that, <laughs> yeah. but uh, but no no more of that for me. Well, let's see. Uh, I'm looking over my list of things I let's wanted to ask you. Let's talk gear, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, you one of the podcasts that we that you that I heard you on. Yeah. You were talking about microphones. And, oh, oh uh, I'm such a mic freak. <laughs> so let's let's backtrack just a little bit. And this is something I kind of like to do. I saw. Um, I can never think of the name of the podcast I saw or the video that I saw this on. Okay. Um, but anyway, it was like a Q and A uh, orchestra. Uh, I'll give you a section, and you give me a microphone that you like to use on it. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. let, let's do sh strings. What do you use on strings? Uh, typically, uh, U eighty nines or uh, AKG 460s, 480s. Uh, I like to use the uh, U89s uh, or U67s if they're available, but not not many places. Perhaps Capital has mm -hmm. uh, you know that many U67s mm -hmm. <laughs> that you know available, but no, normally people don't have that many. Uh, I like to, for my purposes. Um, since the orchestral stuff that I do, mm -hmm. I try to keep the ambience down a bit uh, or try to minimize it. Uh, I like to use all of the string mics in a, in a figure eight pattern and facing essentially almost straight down or at a, a little bit of an angle toward the players so that behind them, the brass that is blaring ah. uh, is not really getting into those mics quite as much. Um, so that's what I use most often. That's, that's my preference. Interesting. I never thought about using figure of eight. Uh, it Mike works like, really, really well. Does it? Okay. Yes, yes. Never thought about it. I thought you were going to say, I don't use Omni, I use cardioid. Right, but, and I, I don't use Omni. No, unless if you're doing a decatree, of course. Right. But... That I, again, in my purposes, the stuff that I do normally, we're not doing that kind of recording. Um, but, uh, but I was going to say something else. Um, oh, you know, if you're using a figure eight for an orchestra and stuff like that, or, or I mean, anyway, it, it doesn't even matter whether you're using whatever mics you're using. The room, of course, is like the most important. Uh, apart from the musicianship, et cetera, mm -hmm. you know, the room plays such a, a huge role in it. And like the rooms that, that well, the, 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 the one that we're recording in now at DZZ, I mean, you're talking about a room that's probably uh, 50 by 80, 50 mm -hmm. by 90. It's, mm -hmm. it's gigantic, gigantic. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, beautiful sounding room. So you almost can't go wrong. With yeah. That. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about brass. What do you use on brass? Uh, Ribbons. Mm -hmm. I, 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 
I've tried using condensers on brass, and it's okay, but to me, uh, to me, there's no substitute. I use uh, whatever ribbons are available. Uh, I love, uh, yeah, I love Royer ribbons. I love uh, Coles 4038s. Um, but, you know, I've used fatheads on these orchestral sessions. Mm -hmm. I've used Cascade mics. I love Cascade mics. I think they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but more to the point, uh, it's that characteristic of, of the ribbon um, and the fact that it does not take your head off when you, you know, when a, a pair of trumpets blow something really hard, right. you know. Uh, I couldn't see using anything else for like trombone. Um, that's 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 the way to go for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ribbons. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the woodwinds. Woodwinds. I, I typically use uh, uh, small diaphragm condensers. I like the AKG, the four sixties, the four eighties, um, KM eighty fours. Again, sometimes. If, usually uh, but again it depends on the ensemble you know again, if there's some heavy percussion behind them then I might have to go for something you know with uh, with a figure eight available and there's not too many of those right, right. <laughs> well the only thing left is uh, percussion I guess you would use uh, ribbons ribbons on that yep, too ribbons. Okay. ribbons on those too yeah yeah and again you know the uh, as far as orchestral stuff I mean you know I I, I am getting an overall picture with a with a stereo mic and, and you know uh, or you know s let's say small diaphragm uh, maybe Sheps M two twenty ones in sort of an ORTF over the orchestra. Uh, I don't do the decatry really for my purposes, mm -hmm. um, but at least with an ORTF right over the orchestra, I get a pretty good balance there, and I'm bringing in uh, you know spot mics as necessary. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, for the stuff that I have right over the drums, right over the percussion, I tend to favor the ribbons. You know, again yeah. that that character. Um, I'm, I've done several projects where where all I used was ribbons and, and used nothing else. I just love the sound, love the sound, and the big band type of stuff, yeah. I did a vocal session. It was a kind of a vintage, rec uh, vintage record. It was four singers, and I, mm -hmm. I remember using all ribbon mics, and mm -hmm. I, I loved the way it sounded. I really yeah. did. So uh, mm -hmm. you're kind of making me want to go grab some more <laughs> ribbons now. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah. Probably need to wrap this up because you need to get to work. I need to get to work. Uh, Slough, where can they? Where can guys find you on the web? Well, I, you know, I, I think the best place probably is sessionswithslough.com. dot com. I mean, that is the website for the podcast. Really, uh, I have yet to do the studio, uh, uh, the studio website itself. You know, it's like I just never got around to it, but. I think I saw somewhere where there was a little tutorial about how to get your studio's website <laughs> going. Uh, uh, might have where to, that is. Can't imagine where that might be. But uh, but anyway, yeah. So sessions with Slough dot com, and that's S L A U for those okay. uh, who don't know. And I think it's a Slowby Sharp on uh, Twitter. Oh, Twitter. Yes, and yes, I am a Twitter hound. I yes, and you you take you are uh, active on Twitter. Uh, yes. Well, cool. Well, Slough, thank you for taking some time, and I look forward to uh, talking with you again sometime, maybe digging a little deeper about uh, some stuff that can help my guys and uh, sure. help me too. So, Oh, wonderful. And thank you so much for, uh, for, for getting in touch in the first place. And, man, I, you know, I took a look at the, at the Mix Coach, and uh, great stuff on there, man. I, I, I wish that when I was starting out, I had such a resource because it's, it's wonderful that you're sharing and just bringing people together and, and sharing knowledge. That's a fantastic thing. Keep it up, man. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for the, for the kind <laughs> words. Well, Slough, I uh, will talk to you soon, I'm sure, okay? Sounds good. Thank you so much, Kevin. Okay.